Over to you, Tom. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's just this whole talk is going to be me typing stuff into the computer and trying to explain stuff to you at the same time. I don't have robots. I have just been totally outclassed in every way because this is a talk about a piece of server-side infrastructure software, which means it's literally the most boring damn thing on the planet. Um, no robots, no cool, no cool uh, graphical programming stuff, just a lot of hashes and and REST API curl calls, which is, uh, okay, so just to help me gauge my audience a little bit here, who, who works in web application development or sort of server-side infrastructure stuff? Okay, cool, uh, a, a decent number of people. So you do, Florin, you know you do. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, I don't have slides. Uh, when I was giving this talk last, I got really, really sick and I didn't have time to prepare slides. And now, of course, I've had three weeks to recover. And of course, I'm using the same excuse, even though I haven't been sick for the last three weeks. Um, I have an agenda. So this is my agenda. I've got to work my way through all of that in the next X minutes. Um, I'm Tom. Cool. OK. Marked off the agenda. Um, I am talking about a piece of infrastructure software called Vault. One, two of you know what it is. Uh, do more than two of you know what it is? Cool, okay. The first thing I have to do is disambiguate it from all the other things called Vault because it seems like these days everybody has a piece of software that they call Vault. Um, V-A-U-L-T, so like named after a safe. Um, it is a piece of software designed to keep your secrets when you're dealing with back-end infrastructure. So who here's a web app developer? Who uses, who, who's written web apps that talk to a database? Everybody. Um, where does the password live? PGPass file, that's not, not the worst uh, option. I, did I hear environment variables? Cool, how'd they get there? How do they get there? Excellent. OK. So the password is embedded during Docker image production. So what if you need to change the password in a hurry? Who, who has ever, on production, been in a situation where they're like, oh, I had better change my uh, database password right now? Who knows exactly what steps they would take to do that? If, uh, yeah, it's. It's, it, it's a funnily non-trivial thing because your web app has to stay online all the time, the database has to stay online all the time, the two have to be able to talk to each other all the time, uh, which means that if you need to suddenly rotate credentials in a hurry, suddenly things become a little bit more stressful. Okay, so I'm not talking about Ansible Vault. I'm not talking about, what are some of the other vaults? Rivera has something called Vault. I don't even know what that is, but Rivera is like a cloud. Yeah, yeah, so Rivera has something, it's like their S3, it's called Vault. It's, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a piece of software which is written in Go. It's, by the, it's um, written by HashiCorp. They're the people who also created Vagrant and Terraform and Atlas and Packer and quite a few other sort of bits of modern DevOps infrastructure tooling that um, are pretty popular. They write, they write pretty good stuff, um, except they have terrible taste in configuration file. Uh, format syntax. Okay, so I told you that Vault is a piece of software. Excellent, we're getting somewhere. What does it actually do? It holds your secrets. You can put stuff in there like my username for X is username and my password is password123. Okay, so it's a, it's a key value store at the simplest level. Um, that's, that's the most basic thing you could use it for off the bat. You can use it for generation of dynamic secrets. So this is where things start to get more interesting. Instead of saying, hey, what is my uh, web app's database password? You can say to Vault, I need a password for my web app, and it will generate one for you. It'll create a user and password for your database, provide them to your web app, and it will expire them after a certain point of time or after you tell them to. Um, it can do that same thing for Amazon credentials. It will generate an Amazon user for you, give you the username and password for it, and say, this will last half an hour. When you're done with it, it'll go away, or tell me when you're done, and it'll go away. 
So the dynamic secrets are when things immediately start getting a lot more interesting with what you can do with it. It has really, really carefully designed access control policies so that you can say, this application can access this secret, and this user can talk to these secrets or generate these secrets, but this user can only use this part of the system. It's got very fine-grained access control stuff. Um, all of the secrets that it keeps are stored in a persistent storage, and they're encrypted on the back end. So if the storage layer was compromised, you know, all of your secrets remain safe with some provisos. But um, it has a very strong security architecture between the bit that actually does the secret management and the bit that actually stores stuff on disk or in your database or wherever you've put it uh, in such a way that you have some security guarantees about the integrity of that data. Um, it has a very flexible authentication mechanism which goes in hand in hand with the policy stuff that the access control policy stuff that I was just mentioning. Uh, it's designed for high availability. Uh, one obvious thing is if this is keeping your secrets, then it's immediately a critical part of your infrastructure, right? Like if it, if it goes down, then all of your secrets are down. So it has a pretty good, highly available architecture. And it provides a couple other cool little bits and pieces, like I'll, I'll, show, um, I'll show you the encryption as a service in a little bit. Um, one of the killer features of it is it has a way of protecting secrets while they're being distributed to where they need to go. I'll demonstrate this in a little bit. Um, what I mean is, if a vault has your database username and password and you need to get it to the web app, something in the middle can say, grab that secret from vault and put it in the web app, and that middleman never actually has access to the secret. Um, it's protected, it can't access it, and I'll demonstrate that shortly as well. Okay, so I'm going to fire up a vault shortly, and I'll be taking you through some of the steps that it can be used for. Um, can everyone read what's on the screen? This is all going to be kind of terminal windows and, and code and stuff, so I can make this bigger. How, how are you going at the back there? Okay. Um, and feel free to ask me questions as I go through stuff, because I'll be yammering. Yes, okay, if you ask me a question, sit tight while I rephrase the question and then pretend to answer it. Okay, I don't really need those widgets anymore. <clears throat> okay, so at its simplest level, just a web service like anything else. It's running at that address, so if I were to curl that, Not a lot going on there that's very interesting. Um, but let's go there with a web server. Okay, I've just fired up my Vault server. And as I told you, the storage backend is encrypted. So Vault does not keep that encryption key anywhere persistent. You have to provide it when you start the server. If you don't, it can't access the backend and it just stays dead. So those keys never end up anywhere near the actual server itself. Um, the actual storage on the back end doesn't look very exciting. If I show you what's being stored on disk, it's just a whole bunch of files. It's just sort of weird key value stuff. There's very little in there that's interesting. All the files are actually encrypted. And the encryption key is split into a number of parts. By default, five. So it's using What's the algorithm called? Shamir's secret sharing. Sorry? Yep. So to unseal the vault, to get it actually running, you have to provide three secrets out of the five you've been given. So if you're, depending on how you, and you can, you can say, like when you, when you configure this, you can say, I want 20 secrets, and I have to use 10 of them to unlock it. Okay, it's, um, and that would, how you handle those is kind of up to you. Like maybe your company has a couple high-ranking individuals, a couple ops people, and you'd give them a couple keys each. So you actually have to have, you actually physically need the participation of two human beings to unlock and get the vault started. Um, in this case, 
my unseal keys, I forgot where I put them. I put them in a file in my home directory. So those are my five keys. They're just in two different formats. Um, and what, I'll, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab one of those keys and I will paste it into there. And as you can see, it says, oh yeah, you've, you've provided one of the three keys that are necessary. So if I, I've gotta give it two more keys and then it'll unseal. But I'm not gonna do it manually pasting it into the UI. I'm gonna run my little unseal script. And all my unseal script is doing is it's reading that file and just throwing three keys at it with curl. So, oop, done. I've thrown my three unseal keys and now I'm actually logged in and actually I'll just log out to show you the, so it's unsealed, it's running, and I can log in using any number of methods. And I've configured that one of the ways that I wanna be able to log into my vault is just with a plain old user and password. So I'm going to give it my username and my password. And now I'm logged in. Um, nope, don't need to save that. Now, one of the really important concepts that Vault needs you to sort of internalize is the concept of login tokens. So all authentication in Vault is you do some sort of authentication and you get back a token. And that token has some kind of access control policy attached to it. And that's how everything works. So what I actually just did was I gave it a username and password and it gave me a token. I'll do it again from here. Vault login method uh, user pass and my username is Tom and my password is that. Okay, now I've logged in on the command line. You can actually see the token that it's given me. All, almost everything in Vault just looks like a UUID. Is everyone still able to read this? Can I, should I make it bigger? Nope, everyone's still nodding. Cool, okay. Um, that token is me. That token has a policy attached to it, which is administrator. And my administrator policy gives me access to basically do whatever I want with Vault. Every token that is um, generated by Vault also has something called a token accessor, which is a way to refer to the token without it actually providing any authentication. So if I have the token, I can do anything in Vault. If I have the token accessor, all I can do is look up that token to see if it's still valid or expire that token if I need to get rid of it in a hurry. Okay, so the token accessor is a way of administering the token that I've been given, but it doesn't provide any of the access control of the token. Um, <clears throat> most people here work in Linux or Unix type systems. Um, the basic architecture of Vault is it acts like a big file system, kind of like how Linux has special file systems like sys or proc, where you write things to certain locations and magic happens, or you read from it and it just kind of acts like a file, or you write to it and actually does something. So all of Vault, it's, the whole thing's a REST API, right? So everything you do in it is either reading from a location or writing to a location, and maybe that location is something special, like writing to it does something special, or maybe writing to it just creates a key value in the key value store. Let's check my agenda and see where I'm at. I have not explained that. I've shown you the tree. I've unsealed my vault. I've shown you the login screen. I've logged in. I've explained that my username and password become a vault token. I haven't shown you what those policies look like, but my administrator token just attached it to a policy that basically says for any path in that virtual file system I was describing, I can do whatever I want. Um, and I'll show you a couple more examples later. Doo, doo, doo. It is explained that Vault UI is basically a Unix magic file system. Yep. Show you what the policies look like. Set and retrieve a generic secret. Okay. So the simplest, the simplest way you would actually use this um, would be to create a secret. And we'll call that secret my secret. And the username will be Tom and the password will be, what's the most secure password you can think of right now? One, two, three, four, five. Sounds like someone's luggage. Um, oh, come on, who's seen Spaceballs? Come on, just one, okay. 
<laughs> we're, st we're stopping this talk and we're just gonna watch Spaceballs. Okay. What did I just call it? My secret? Boom. Okay. Look at that. I actually set a value and retrieved it. That's super exciting. Okay. Um, okay. So that, that doesn't seem like much, but it's, it's, it's a pretty useful first step to have a secure place that you can get and retrieve stuff quite conveniently. Um, what Volt just did behind the scenes, again, it's just a straight up get from a web API with one extra header, and that header is the, the, the Vault login token. Okay, so that's, that's really all there is to the entire API, um, which is one of the nicest things about it. And it's all sort of JSON, you send and receive, sorry. You access your remote database, Sorry? You access your remote database. I'm accessing a... Um, are you asking in the context of this talk? In the context of this talk, I'm running Vault in a Docker container sitting here on my laptop. Yeah, but in general, you wouldn't. You'd have it somewhere central. So when you retrieve it, it would... All over SSL. So Vault, um, Vault will rely on TLS encryption. Um, Vault is... You, it runs its own HTTPS server, and you give it the certificates to run. And you can tell it to run in HTTP mode, and it will tell you, please don't do that, except for when you're learning how to use it. Um, but all, it's all embedded into its own binary, because it's a, it's a Go program. So it's one big statically compiled binary. Um, and you generally wouldn't put anything in front of it. You wouldn't put, in, you wouldn't put it behind a reverse proxy. You would just expose it. Um, it's reasonably solid, reasonably resilient. You could restrict it by IP address as needed. Um, and you can also use client-side certificate authentication if you wanted to as well. But yes, it relies on, it relies on TLS for the security of the transport. One of the reasons why you want to put all your secrets in one place is so that you know who's accessing them at all times. So if I fire up the audit log here, every, <coughs> excuse me, Every request and response is fully logged in the audit log. Um, and if the audit log is inaccessible, then actually the response isn't even sent. So it, it works kind of atomically that way. If, you, um, if I asked for a secret and then it can't write into the log that I was provided that secret, it won't, have, it won't send me the secret. So if I... This is just watching the audit log now. And so if I do that same uh, get that I did before, what you end up seeing in the audit log is the full log of the request. And all the secret things in the audit log are hashed. So that um, the audit log, you can't, you can't it's, it's showing me that the response was a password and a username. And it's hashed the actual data of those so that I could go, oh, well, was the password 12345? I would be able to check that that was actually it. Um, but can't reverse from that back to the secrets. And actually, I think at the moment, the way this is configured, you can't actually check that password is that one because I think that the salt for that HMAC is not provided by Vault, but that's configurable. So. What I could do is look at that and go, oh, it's provided that same secret to a bunch of people from the audit log. But the audit log itself is, unless you flip a bunch of switches that they warn you not to flip, the audit log is generally not gonna have secrets in it itself. But I'll leave the audit log there, sitting there running so that you can see what it's actually doing. This, the audit log actually uh, is a big stream of JSON objects, right? So everything's just encoded as a JSON object, and I'm just pretty printing them here for us to be able to look at. Gets as big as any other request log. You'll want to rotate it regularly if you use Vault a lot. Yep. Um, and the audit log has, an, has a bunch of backends, so um, just like the secret backends. So you can send it to a TCP endpoint or a log stash, or you can just write it to a file, which is what I'm doing, or you can deliver it to RSYS log or whatever. Generic secret, audit log, dynamic secrets are far more interesting. 
So Vault has built-in support for a bunch of different kinds of secrets that it can actually generate and manage for you. I have about a half a dozen running here. I'll demonstrate some of those. And I'll show you the list of secret engines that it has. So I'll be showing you how the AWS one works for generating AWS credentials. Console is another HashiCorp product. Um, database is a, is a generic database backend that handles MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, um, the, 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 the main relational databases. Um, Google Cloud credentials. KV is Vault's built-in key value store, the one that I just showed you by setting username and password in. I don't know what Nomad is. No, KV is literally just the key value store that I have just used just now in Vault. It's one of Vault's built-in things. So it's not a dynamic secret generator for any outside service. Um, RabbitMQ if you use that. PKI is why I started using Vault in the first place. So PKI is set up, is mount a Vault backend that um, generates your own certificate authority and you can use to then generate certificates. So this to me, this was the use case that got me using Vault in the first place. I needed, I needed a dynamically generated public key infrastructure for a VPN where the VPN certificates were being rotated very rapidly every day, needed new certificates. So I needed a convenient way of generating those in a backend system. So that's how I got onto Vault in the first place. Um, it can handle all your SSH credentials for you in a couple different methods by either setting up users on the fly or setting up credentials on the fly or by using SSH's own PKI infrastructure because SSH has an operating mode where you can sign keys and that grants permission to log into things. So Vault will handle that for you. Uh, Transit, I'll demonstrate this evening. Transit is on the fly encryption as a service. So if you just need a piece of data encrypted, but you're gonna then store that encrypted data somewhere else in your own database, in your own web app, um, this is a encryption backend that does public key or symmetrical encryption for you so that you've probably been told never write your own crypto. Yeah. Um, so if you, if you need to store something encrypted in your database, in your web app, and it does need to be in your database or web app, this is probably a pretty good way of handling the encryption of it, and so on. So as you can see, there's a couple others. All these database ones got replaced by this databases one a little while ago. So I'm gonna show you what the databases one does. I have set up a Postgres database that I'm gonna use with a web app, and I'm gonna use the database's backend, which doesn't play well with this user interface here, but What that looks like, I have a web app that needs credentials to talk to its database. And so all it would need to do is read a secret from the database's backend at, ah, thank you. Hey, cool. Okay, check that out, boom, 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 boom. Okay, every time I call, I need database credentials for the role called web app. And in Vault, the web app role is configured as a certain set of create user SQL commands sent to a certain database that I've configured. And it will generate the username and password for me and provide them back. Now, there's a couple things going on here that are really important. The first one is, the credentials are, all credentials generated by Vault are always tied to something called a lease. So that lease represents that set of credentials and it represents the relationship between the token that generated the credentials and those credentials. So the token that I'm using is the one that I logged in as before. And if I revoke that token, every credential generated by that token goes away immediately. So if, my log, if my Vault token gets compromised, I can go, oh crap, my token's gotten compromised, kill it. And it will immediately revoke all of the credentials that it just generated. And that includes all of these database usernames and passwords that it just generated. It, it does, it drops the user. You, you actually specify what commands it runs. So by default, it's just dropping the user. 
but in practice what you would want to do is send a few Postgres commands like drop the user, reassign the ownership of all objects created by that user to some default user, and terminate any connections opened by that user immediately. So those are all, those are separate SQL statements, but you would, you would configure the role to just run all those every time it was dropping a user. Um, and then the other thing is every lease has a duration. And that duration can be configured to whatever you want it to be, but you can't set it to zero. And you can also allow it to be like a low number, like a day or an hour or whatever, but give it, allow, give it permission to renew itself. Um, so you kind of design how you want your secret life cycle to be, but the key point is that your life cycle ends at some point. So all of those credentials are temporary in some way. Now let's say I was suddenly concerned that those credentials that I've just shown you, maybe I exposed them in a, in a talk in front of a whole bunch of people and now they're kind of exposed and I want to get rid of them in a hurry. I can go and have a look at all of those leases that I had just made somewhere. So here are all the active leases on credentials right now. And I can go, oh crap, I'm actually a little worried about this database. Let's just get rid of them all. Boom. Okay. All those, all those database users are now gone. They're, they're toast. And had I added those extra SQL commands, they'd all be kicked off the server as well. The web app would not be working if its credentials were amongst those, yeah. Um, you have to? Yeah. Cool. Um, let's see. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna actually run a web app and show you how that ends up working. So who, who does work in Django? Okay, so some of you will recognize what I'm about to show you, but basically, Django is Python web framework and you configure your database credentials and your other secrets into a Python file. And since it is a Python file, you can basically have it run whatever code you want to get the code you need, to get the, the results you need. So my settings file, this is, to anyone who's worked in Django, this is gonna look pretty familiar, but it's doing one or two other special things. Um, it's importing the Vault Python client and then connecting to my Vault server. Now, it's using another, like I, like I told you before, the authentication backends get some form of credentials and then give you a Vault token. So I'm using for my app a specific login method which is designed basically for programmed apps. And so the role ID here um, is not the token but it's more like a username. And you combine the role ID with the secret ID and you get a login, you log in, you get a token. So I've given, I've given my Django app the role ID, and that's the sort of thing that you would happily bake into a Docker container. Like that, that role ID is not secret. The secret ID is something that you would still want to protect, and so you'd probably provide that by an environment variable or something if you're doing, if you're doing this the 12-factor or you know, Kubernetes orchestration anyway. That's logging into Vault, and then the Django secret key is being read from one of those generic key value secrets that I showed you before, because it's a static secret. In fact, I'll show you which one it is. If I go to my key value store and I look at web app, you'll see that that is the Django secret key that this app is gonna read. It's a static secret that needs to be the same all the time. And then every time this app starts up, if I go down to the database settings, it's gonna request a set of database credentials from Vault and then fill in those settings into the web app. So, if I start my web app, <clears throat> we actually just saw the request, two, two requests happen in the audit log, so let's just have a look at those. So one of the requests was, hey, I need that credential from the web app. And the response was above it for some reason. No, it wasn't. Eh, I don't know where it is, but yeah. And then it also asked for database credentials for the web app, and it got those provided as well. And here's the lease ID in case I need to uh, restrict it later. 
and its lifespan, because all leases have an expiry date on them as well. I'm not sure where that's gone, but it would be in there too. Okay, and then if I go to my web app, yay, I'm not a designer. Um, but yeah, so this is talking to the database, and it's doing it using credentials that didn't exist five seconds ago. And it's using credentials that won't exist as soon as I close the, no, sorry. There's, I, haven't, I haven't set up any smarts for it to automatically revoke those credentials when I close the app, but there's, there's, there's ways you could handle that if, you'd want, if you wanted to. So the question for the recording was, um, how would you handle a long running Django process? I would do it by keeping it restarted every once in a while. Um, Django, specifically Django, is not terribly smart about generating new database credentials while it's running. It kind of expects those to be static. So you, if you're trying to do it in Django, you've got another set of problems because Django does its own connection pooling and you'd have to dig deep to fix that. So, um, and having said that, the other thing that you could do is you could have it set to a very short lifespan, the secret, and, and Django could renew it constantly. And that would, that would be a good way of making sure that not long after the process ended, those credentials would be revoked as well. Like if you set the, if you set the lifespan of the database credentials to one minute, and then your web app was just renewing the token every 20 seconds, then it would just automatically die when the process did. Yeah, the lease, the lease can be extended, but if the lease is expired, it can't. So you can, you can have your login token and you can renew that. And all of this is configurable again. You, you invent, you, they've given you a lot of great tools for inventing your life cycle, but they haven't given you a lot of best practices documentation to decide how you would do it. So you'd invent it in a way that worked best for what you were trying to do. Um. <clears throat> Hey, what else do we want to show you? Response wrapping. So the way I've designed my web app, it actually has login credentials to Vault. And it is logging in. It has permission to do those two things I showed you. If I go to the policy that my web app is using, it has permission to read the one static secret, and it has permission to read from the generate credentials thing, and it can't do anything else. So that's how my web app accesses Vault. Um, but let's say you don't want it to log in at all. You don't trust it to have that ability. Because if someone compromised, if someone compromised my web app, they would be able to generate database credentials. They'd only be able to generate them with the same limited um, permissions that I had configured in Vault. But that's still an issue. So, If you knew, yes, as soon as you, as, as soon as you knew something bad was happening, you'd have all kinds of tools to, to deal with it. But um, that's the trick, isn't it? Um, so I'll just show you how response wrapping works. Because this is how you would say, let's say you're, you have an intermediary, your Ansible or your Kubernetes or your orchestration scripts needed to pull the secret from Vault and give them to the web app but you didn't want it to know what those secrets were. What you do is Ansible. Um, I'll be demonstrating this at the Ansible meetup in a few weeks, actually. I'm speaking at things for free pizza these days. Um, okay, everything that Vault does can be wrapped in a response. It can be wrapped in an envelope. So if I say, I need database credentials, but I want this wrapped up for 15 minutes, okay. What this has actually just done is it's generated the credentials that I need, and instead of giving me the credentials, it's given me something that looks like a login token. It's given me a wrapping token and a wrapping accessor. And that token is what you would use to get those credentials back out of Vault. So the credentials are made and stored, and now what Ansible would do, would do what my orchestration system will do, is it will deliver to my web app this token and say, grab your database details with that. And my web app, let's um, do this in another window. So pretend that this is on my web app. It would do the simple curl call to unwrap that token. 
So, yeah, thanks. And it said, hey, give me, what, give me what's behind that token. And it's given you the database credentials that were asked for. And that token is now expired. So, if you had tried to do it again, it'll error out. So, this is where the, sec this is where the security comes from because if you've delivered that token to your web app and the web app tries to unwrap the token and it finds out that it's not valid, it can immediately raise the alarm and go, hey, something might have intercepted that credential that you just tried to give me and you can immediately revoke it. And of course, all of that's automatable as well. You'd have to, you'd have to write your own kind of thingy to magically make that happen. The, the default wrapping mechanism that I just used uh, is a single use thing that can't be re can't be renewed or, or re-wrapped. But, um, so the lease expiry, which, which expiry are you looking at? Sorry, that's that one? Yeah. Okay, so that's how long the database credentials will live. Um, but the wrapping token that I generated was only gonna live 15 minutes. So let's make that 10 seconds. And like, because Ansible's pretty fast, maybe it will just take, you know, five, six, Seven. Oops, I need to actually paste the thing in. I'm not gonna win this race. Nope, and I pasted it in the wrong place. And it's already gone. Right, so Ansible took too long to actually deliver my thing. So if I, stupid SSH lagging everywhere. But if we do this a little bit more efficiently. Aha, yeah, so you can, you can set that to a really low number if you want. And I'm just using the kind of default settings there where it will last for however long I give it, but will only be one use. But you could do it, you, can, you could set it to be two uses. You could set it to be three uses. But the, real, the really useful use case is I've wrapped up some secret. I'm going to give you the token for unwrapping that secret. And you better tell me if there's something wrong with that token, and I'll immediately cancel that secret. So that's where that security comes from. If you, uh, the question was, could the database get new credentials if you did it this way? If, could the web app? Uh, probably not. This is, this is basically all push, right? So this, the, if you're doing it this way, then that probably means that you've got some piece of infrastructure in the middle that's mediating all of these secrets. So, and the reason you would do it this way also is that now Vault isn't a critical part of your infrastructure. So the way I've designed, the way I wrote the web app before, where it's actually logging into Vault and grabbing credentials, if my vault goes down, my website goes down, my whole infrastructure goes down. But if you actually only needed vault itself during the Ansible run, for example, then it's not in the critical path flow. But, Make, but you still need to go to that whole vault yeah, but you'd be doing that during that orchestration run. It wouldn't, it wouldn't sit with the token. Yeah, it wouldn't sit with the token for hours. It would, you, you'd, you'd do it with like 10 or 15 seconds or a minute or something. You'd, it would, yeah. Um, the, the, the way you would push secrets is you'd wrap it, you'd send the token out there, it would unwrap it and just stash it in slash Etsy, slash my secrets, whatever. Okay. Then you'd be, then you'd need Vault to be online if, if, you, were, if you were renewing leases that way. So if you're, if you're pushing credentials out, if you're pushing credentials out, you'd use a let's encrypt model. You'd say, make the secret last 90 days, renew it every month, and warn me if it seems like the renewal's not working, right? Um, so you can, you, can, you, can, you can, again, you can design the life cycle however you want, but if you were pushing secrets out, you wouldn't be using token renewal. You'd be making it probably last longer and make sure that you were renewing them yourself on a regular basis. Okay, I was gonna demonstrate the Amazon thing, and then we're pretty much done. Um, so, honestly, it works kind of the same as the database one. Let's, I've created a couple different AWS configuration roles here, and they're tied to, who, who uses Amazon as a fairly regular part of their life? Yeah. <coughs> You're probably familiar with just how nightmarish like dealing with Amazon security policies are. It's, it's complicated and powerful, and that's good, but yeah. Um, so, oops, I'm generating credentials. 
oh hey, there's some, there's some Amazon credentials for you that will access everything in all of my S3 buckets. Um, but they're only gonna last 900 seconds, so, eh, doesn't matter. Okay, so, what I have here, the last thing that I'm gonna demonstrate, is a script that generates Let's Encrypt certificates for anything you want. Um, well, that you own, obviously. Um, who uses Let's Encrypt for generating web certificates? It's great, isn't it? Who uses DNS authentication for it? Yeah, not, not as many people, but... Yes. Um, so, Michael Fincham spent a lot of time getting this sorted out, and so he was very stoic when I demonstrated how, how this works. But, okay, what I have is I have a Python script that requests, so, sorry, backing up a little bit. With Let's Encrypt, normally it authenticates that you're allowed to generate that certificate by talking to your web server at the right address. But you can also tell it, you can also authenticate yourself by changing DNS records. So prove, by proving you control the DNS records of the site, it will generate the certificate for you. And can, internal. For example, this is not a site on the internet. This is a Docker container running on my laptop. The, the Let's Encrypt servers did not have access to vault.int. Um, I needed to generate that by manipulating DNS records and thus proving that I control the Eastman domain. And conveniently, Let's Encrypt actually has a plugin for Route 53, which is Amazon's DNS system that just makes that really easy. So if your if you're DNS is handled by Amazon, you can actually do that authentication really, really simply. So I've wrapped Let's Encrypt in a script that generates credentials that have permission to manipulate DNS addresses. So it uses the vault role and secret ID that I was explaining to you before. That's just for logging into my vault. Then, so that's it logging into vault. Then it generates, it asks Vault to generate an Amazon user that has permission to manipulate my DNS records. All of this is just debugging stuff. And then it just runs CertBot with whatever commands I gave it. And then it will revoke the Amazon user. Okay, so whenever I need a Let's, en whenever I need a Let's Encrypt certificate of any kind, I can just run this script. It generates the credentials it needs, it generates the certificate, and then it destroys the credentials it used. So, let's run it. Who wants a certificate? Um, let's get rid of that. Let's make that smaller. Um, is great. Z. And go. So, it's basically just you could I could have done this in a shell script as well, right? Because it just it's all just curl commands. It just would be really ugly. Um, oop. And there's a bug. And the bug was right there. Boop, 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 boop. Let's try again. There we go. So those are Amazon credentials that can do anything to any domain I own. So go nuts. You don't have very long. <laughs> and now CertBot is running. And CertBot's just grabbing those credentials out of the usual Amazon environment variables, you know, AWS, secret access key, et cetera. And all the rest of it's just kind of CertBot magic doing its thing, because CertBot knows how to use those credentials to manipulate the DNS records as needed. Um, and while that's going, because Amazon takes a little while, any other questions? Um, sorry? Oh, yeah, well, go nuts. <laughs> Besides, actually, one reason why I was having fun giving this talk is um, I gave it in front of a whole bunch of hackers and security people at the ISIG meetup, and I was flashing these credentials on screen, and, and some of them were trying to be cheeky, but... Um, because I'm not a complete idiot, this secret key right here has the last three characters trimmed off of it. 
So you've only got 45 seconds to try and manipulate those keys, but also you still have to guess three more alphanumeric characters on the end, so you're, you're not gonna make it in time. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's a lot of really important use cases for this stuff, but the most important one, and probably the most annoying one as well, is that it forces you to choose a life cycle for your secrets. And everyone has, every, everyone who has web infrastructure has that WP config file with a database password still sitting in it that's been the same password for like 10 years because your WordPress blog has not been updated in a while. Um, every, and uh, everyone has, you know, the, I don't know, the, the, the celery task queue password. No one rotates those on a regular basis. No one, all those things just sit there stagnant until you realize you've been compromised and you go, oh man, how many years was that, was that like that? Um, and by forcing you into using a, a, life, a life cycle for your secrets, you actually will be able to keep stock of how many you've got. Because otherwise they're just sitting in files everywhere. Maybe, for, for, people, for people who have their stuff together, they're probably sitting in Ansible Vault or in Hiera's encrypted store or something. But um, that's taking forever to authenticate. Oh, cleaning up challenges. No, don't try and install it on my Nginx. And done. Yeah. And so by the time that last line is my script saying revoking the access token, and revoking the access token immediately hits the kill switch on the Amazon credentials that were made. Um, yeah, so that's how we, that's like at, at work now, that's how we handle all of our Let's Encrypt certificates. In fact, we have an automated job that just renews them as necessary, generates the credentials, renews them, and then throws the certificates into Vault in the key value store where our various apps then pick them out and put them where they need to go. So we're using Vault as the sort of data store for those certificates as well once they're generated. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I had to show you. So please, ask me anything. Uh, you mentioned you run through, yeah, you'll run, run three Vaults. Um, and one of them is always the active one. And if you're, you can just throw all three of them onto your DNS round robin or whatever because if the request hits this one, it'll get forwarded to the active one. Um, or it can redirect your request if, if all three of them have like different DNS names, but you probably just want them in a cluster. Um, and I showed you the file store, I showed you the, the file system storage layer that I'm using but the back end can be in a bunch of different, the, the, the back end storage is pluggable. So I'm using the file system one right here. At work I use Amazon DynamoDB as the back end store. You can also use Postgres, you can also use HashiCorp's console, and only some of these support high availability. The file system one doesn't. Uh, the DynamoDB one does, console does, etcd does. Um, so if you're, using, if you're using a fancy key value raft consensus algorithm backing store, then you've got high availability in Vault essentially for free because it relies on some of the guarantees of the backing store. But if you're using the file system one like I am for this demonstration this evening, you're, you're not, you don't get the high availability out of it. Sorry, uh, Richard, right? Yeah. yeah, Richard's question or Richard's comment was you've, you've still got a secret you, your web app still has a secret, and it's still the sensitive part, and you're just moved which secret is in the sensitive part, right? So that's, broadly speaking, that's true, the way I demonstrated this web app, but if you're using the push mechanism, it's kind of less true because you're delivering the secrets to the place, and they can still be short-lived, and they can stay there for a little while and then be replaced by your intermediary. Um, and that would restrict what someone who's compromised that web app could do. Like, they'd have access to that secret just at that time. Um, but they wouldn't have access to Vault to generate new ones. It, again, it, it, it gives you a tool to define how you want that life, life cycle to look. And it also helps you refresh secrets easily and rescind them if you have uh, a compromise. 
or become, a, or, or become even nervous that you might have had a compromise. You've got better tools to audit what might have been accessed, audit where those secrets went, revoke a tree of secrets based on, oh, that token is compromised, I better get rid of whatever it generated. So, yes, eventually you still have some secrets in places, but you know which ones they are and you have better logs of how they got there. Basically, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, like, if you're just using it as a key value, then maybe you're not getting that much out of it, but I, but as soon as you're using it for dynamic credentials, then suddenly it feels a lot more freeing, yeah. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah. Um, I think the people who are expecting you to use a tool like this probably expect you to have some kind of rolling deployment mechanism already. So if you're running your web apps in containers in Kubernetes or in some other orchestration thing, they would, they'd, if, you're, if you're rotating credentials on your web app, you'd need some way of doing that in a high available, highly available manner anyway. So maybe you're doing that with a rolling restart on Kubernetes where it's killing a Docker container and firing up that one, grabbing new credentials for it, then killing the next one. Or you just do it one at a time and you've got some other round robin-y thing handling requests. Yeah, so the, the, expect, the expectation would be that under normal operating circumstances, by the time you're expiring credentials, no, they're not being used anywhere. So you'd have, again, you, maybe you'd say, restart your application servers every week and expire credentials every two, uh, after two weeks, then the assumption will always be that they're using credentials, that by the time a database credential is set, is due to expire under normal operating circumstances, like not if you're pulling them because you're worried about a compromise, but um, under normal circumstances, again, like think about the let's encrypt model. Imagine, imagine your database credentials were set to last 90 days and you were rotating them every six, every 30 days, you know, then you'll never hit that problem. That's right, that's right, yeah. So again, like I, I find I find the Let's Encrypt model a useful one just because when you generate, when you have that renewal certificate, the old one